minions that worked on it. Thank you for that. So, hey, if you worked on the building that we're sitting in right now, just raise your hand. If you, if you put a nail in, if you put some caulk down, whatever. Yeah. The history of this church and the heritage of this church goes way beyond what you see sitting in this sanctuary. I was thinking this morning, I was thinking this morning about how many saints, even since I've been here, that I've buried. How many are no longer with us? I think about Earl Stevenson, my friend, my buddy, the guy that I, that I, that I put a lot of faith in, and he put a lot of faith in me in the short time we were together. I think about um, Mr. Chockley. Think about him this morning and, and so many others. Hazel, we just buried Hazel not too long ago. And, and you know, all these individuals that have gone before us now sit in the great cloud of witnesses watching over us. What a great history and heritage we have here at Dunkirk Nazarene Church. A call to worship this morning is going to come out of Psalms 150. I'm just going to go old school with this. It says, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens and praise him in the acts of power and praise him in his surpassing greatness. Praise him with, surround, with, with the sounding of the trumpets. Praise him with the harps and the lyres. Praise him with the trembles and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipes. And praise him with the clashing of cymbals. And praise him with resounding cymbals. And it finishes up by saying, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And that final line, it just says, Praise the Lord. So if you'd stand with me this morning, we'll have prayer. And the worship team will come. It's going to be kind of broken up this morning. Those blue books that are in front of you are called hymnals. They're called hymnals. We will be using those this morning a little bit. So you'll be breaking those open along with us. But this morning, will you just join us in prayer? Father, we love you. We praise you and we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your goodness and for your surpassing greatness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are coming, we come into this house to worship you. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, amen. We love you, in your name we pray, amen. Let's go. Let's worship the Lord.
today, I can feel it. You open up those blue little books you have in front of you to song number 262. We did this last night. It's He Lives. He Lives. Aren't you glad to know that Christ Jesus lives today? Not only that, but He walks with me and He talks with me along life's merry way. Praise His holy name this morning. Let's sing out to Him this morning.
may be seated. Everybody can, so you, can, you can shout out an amen if you'd like. It'd be okay. It'd be all right if you amen that. Hey, um, Sister Tina's going to come up. And all week long, we've been sharing all the names of the pastors who have gone before us. All the way back to 1922, we have all the, pa all the pastors' names. And the only ones that are available to be here this morning are Reverend Absher and myself. Dave Boots couldn't be here because he's gonna, he's, it's his anniversary weekend and he's gone. But yeah, I do have a little, le a little note I'm going to read to you after she gets done So from him. So go ahead. Okay, this is the last time I'm going to read them up here, but I don't ever want you to forget these names, okay? This is our history as much as this church. If it wasn't for these pastors that came here and put up with us, and we all know what I'm talking about, put up with us. We would not be here today. We would not be celebrating 100 years. And we know they put up with a lot because a lot of them only spent one year here, okay? I'm just saying. I'm calling it as I see it. Here we go. In reverence, let's once again give them some reverence for all the good hard work they've done. Lauren Pendry, 1921 to 1927. D.A. Glaze. 1927 to 1928. And when you know these people, please raise your hand. F.D. Wright, 1928 to 1929. I should, I was going to say, I should see a hand. J.D. Horine, 1929 to 1931. Marion Brown, 1931 to 1934. C.H. Templin, 1934 to 1936. Lloyd Lunsford, 1936 to 1937. R.L. Lunsford, 1937 to 1938. Charles Potter, 1938 to 1939. Arvin Simon, 1939 to 1942. E.L. Stafford, 1942 to 1944. Charles Barkley, we all know his story, 1944 to 1945. He left to go play basketball. <laughs> I'm kidding, you guys. <laughs> Charles Barkley, no. So. <laughs> Ellie Different Shoemaker, guy. 1945 to 1946. Lewis Piner, 1946 to 48. Ralph Merritt, 1948 to 1952. Merle Moore, 1952 to 1953. There's some hands. William Franklin, 1953, 1956. Vernal Grubbs, 1956 to 1960. Okay, I'm seeing some hands. David Whittaberry, 1961 to 1965. That was a one of them, huh? <laughs> Everett Trimble, 1965 to 1968. Tim's dad. Uh -huh. Bond Bailey, 1968 to 1969. I lost my spot. Uh, Robert Shidley, 1969 to 1972. Burl Taylor, not Burt. Burl Taylor, 1972 to 1976. Carl Dawson, 1976 to 1985. Anybody know this guy? John Abshire, 1985, yes, to 1999. Dave Boots from 1999 to 2009. And this last guy, kind of a character, Tom Fett, 2009. <laughs> <laughs> Knock it off. My reward's in heaven, doggone it. <clears throat> I got a letter written from Dave Boots. Dave, I don't know if you're watching this morning, but thank you for sending this. And uh, I think it's important that we remember all of our pastors. And Dave, like I said, he couldn't be here today because it's his anniversary weekend and they're out doing whatever anniversaries people do. I don't know. Actually, I kind of do know, but he's out doing his thing, whatever. <clears throat> he says, here are some fond memories and thoughts I have about my time at Dunkirk. For ten years I, have spent, I spent there with some of my best times of ministry and growing up. 
We came in really green and young. However, you're patient and kind. When we arrived, Bryson was only four years old and Autumn was 18 months. Our family was growing. I remember learning a lot about being a pastor, husband, father from you folks. Many of the memories we have had from some of the folks who have gone to, on to glory allow me to share a few. Now, some of this stuff is kind of funny. If you knew Earl Stevenson in any way, shape, or form, the first story is about him, and it says this. I remember Earl Stevenson bringing vegetables to the door way before DoorDash. <laughs> I didn't know who they were from until I began to ask. He would drop off, da drop off and dash. Earl was such a kind person and Ruth so gentle. They were both so funny, I enjoyed hanging, out, hanging around them and learning and hearing some jokes. One time Earl was in the hospital. Earl spent a lot of time in the hospital. And he was, he was ran over by the trap by a tractor. He's pulling pulling up fence posts, and some of, and somehow the tractor went into gear and ran, ran over Earl's, bra breaking his sternum, shoulder, and the side of his face. He looked awful, but still in good spirits. As I arrived, Ruth, of course, was there, and her first words were, "Pastor, you didn't have to come." I said, "Ruth, Earl was ran over by a tractor." <laughs> I tried to get the inflection that he would probably share. Ruth responded, don't worry about him. He just wanted attention. <laughs> he said, I couldn't help but laugh. And Earl told Ruth to stop, that he was, if he laughed too hard, it would hurt. He said, I never forgot that. Then there was Bob Davenport. What a gracious and funny guy. I learned a lot of funny jokes from him. However, it was Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And Dirk or Dunkirk was always gracious to our family. I felt so blessed by you all. Anyway, it was Bob's turn to give the gifts to the pastor. I remember it was a gas grill. I said I'd never owned a gas grill before. And when Bob brought it to me in the front, he brought the grill out and gave me a big hug. Then the big one landed. Bob kissed me on the cheek in front of the whole congregation. <laughs> He says, I've never been kissed on the cheek by a man. It was shocking. I could not believe it. But I still preached regardless of the embarrassing moment. <laughs> My side of the family had never been a hugging family ever. When I came, I could not get away. You taught me how to hug and how to hug right. Your gentle spirit was what I needed. Don appreciated that as well. Then came two more boys. One, one more funny. I remember greeting at the door and Bryson was five. Billie Jean came in, and I greeted her, and Bryson asked if she was really a hillbilly. <laughs> she was so kind, Dave said, he said, she said, honey, yes, I am. <laughs> I remember paying off the church and burning the mortgage. What a celebration. I remember the altars were lined with people getting saved and sanctified and the help they needed, and so many children in the caravans was bursting at the seams in the, in the back. He says, when I think of Dunkirk, I think of joy and boogie-oogie. She said, you can ask Kathy Trimble about that. I remember praying for so many folks to get saved. We had Miracle Sunday and many miracles came out of that. It was amazing. What a great heritage of love, joy, and holiness. Probably the best thing about this congregation, you can serve and you have serving. I love that. Sincerely, Dave, Don, Bryson, Autumn, Carson, and Ethan. That was a letter from Pastor Dave. And Dave, if you're watching, thank you for that. I've read it over three or four different times, and it's just a really, uh, it's a congratulatory letter to you and the hard work that you've put into building, growing, and serving this church. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We do have, I don't know, the only, the only announcement I'm going to make this morning is after service. Do not go home. Come to the back of the church with us. Come to the back of the church with us. We're having a hog roast and all the trimmings that come along with it. You are welcome to join us. We would love to have you come, be part of that, to join us in having a good time with that. So we're going to have the offering this morning. If I get a couple of ushers to come up this morning. Um, you guys have been so faithful in giving and so gracious in all that you do. We are grateful for that this morning. Thank you for that.
Let's pray. Father, we love you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your kindness to us. Again, for your mercies that are renewed every day. Thank you, Father, for the, for the way you've been blessing our church. And Father, take, as we take up this offering, Lord, would you just, would you just bless it? Would you bless this offering and, and multiply it, Lord Jesus, as we serve your community? And Father, would you bless those that give and bless those that can't right now? Father, would you just hand us beyond that? We love you this morning. We praise you. In your name we pray. better than him. <laughs> Nothing. If you'd stand with us this morning, we're going to continue singing, but you're going to have to get your hymn books back out. <laughs> Sister Judy's here with us, all the way from Atlanta, Texas. 
Yeah. No, it's more about yeehaw, right? Our Texarkana. Our Texarkana. Actually, she lives in a town that my daughter-in-law grew up in. So, and so there's people in her church that actually know my daughter-in-law. It's kind of fun. But we're going to turn our page to 503. This is kind of the church, our Nazarene church anthem. Called unto holiness. If you could stand, stand with us, please. And we'll sing out this morning.
That was good singing. Good singing there, brothers and sisters. Hey, you know, we're putting all this together this morning, for this last few weeks and months, whatever. And I was trying to think, who could come and share this morning? Who could come and share on Sunday morning for our church? And um, Reverend Absher is more than just the guy that used to pastor here. Reverend Absher is my friend. You know, a lot of times when pastors come and fill the pulpit of another pastor, that's just kind of like taboo to have any kind of connection with them anymore. But Reverend Absher and Norma have been so kind and so beautiful spirited. They love this church. They love you. And I thought, yeah, why not? Let's call John out of retirement one more time and come share the good news with us this morning. Brother John, you come. Come on up here, big guy. We're going to get you a chair all set up here, and I'll get you mic'd up here, and we'll be ready to go. Red, Kevin? If you're, a, if you're part of John a Reverend Absher's family, would you just stand? I want to see who's here this morning to love on this man. Yeah. Brother John, I love you, buddy. You're a good man. Give us the good stuff, big guy. Don't hold that. Let me say this. Anything that you see done around here, I didn't do it. <laughs> the Lord did it. Yeah. Fellow sitting back here and looks at me and grins. And I said, I'm going to call your name many times. He said, don't do that. Tim, you was there. <laughs> I remember, you know, that we would do this, we would do that, and the plan was to come to this. And every time we would start to do something this way, something else would come up. In the old sanctuary, the old building, we were standing outside, right at the steps. Looked at Tim and said, Tim, we've got to get on with it. We've got to stop doing this and doing that. The fellowship building across the street was one of them. We looked at that and looked at it. If you remember, it was a parts store. We looked at it and looked at it, and finally, the fellow that owned that parts store from Portland, he come over one day and he had a packet in his hand. We started out with a price on that store and that property at $85,000. He kept coming down and kept coming down. Nope. Kept coming down and kept coming down. Nope. So I walked out to the old sanctuary and there he stood at the steps and says, I've got to get rid of this. You know, I need $85,000 for that property. Yeah. You can have it for 23,000. I said, perhaps maybe the Lord is talking to us. So what we wasn't going to do on Sunday evening, that next Sunday, church board voted to buy it. So we owned the parts store across the street with all of the fixtures in it and everything for $23,000. Sold part of those to forget the fellow's name, but uh, he had a business down on the south side of town. Sold part of them to him and he paid us for it. 
supposed to buy the rest of them for two hundred dollars we never got it but he got the, the, the rest of the fixtures don't know what happened to the rest of it but we don't fuss over things like that you know we just let the Lord handle it so then uh, I'd been on a mission trip and uh, come home from that mission trip dead tired if you ever ever been on one of those with us you know what they were like you worked but I come home and I said to my wife I says we've got to go to church tonight Wednesday night we've got to go to church so we drove over and right out at the end of the walkway was a sign property for sale oh my we've got to get that I walked in and Tim's gonna remember this I told him I was gonna call his name a lot I walked in and I said Tim did you see that sign out there Earl his father-in-law Margie Kathy your dad Cheryl sitting across on the other side and I learned not to pay a whole lot of attention to what Earl said other than just to remain friends with him but Earl said yeah we're not going to pay that for it hmm okay just looked at Tim we went on talking Sunday evening though we bought we voted to buy the property and Earl was the last vote on it it said well nobody else is going to vote against it I'm not either Amen. so a lot, a lot of stories goes along with it you know and my experience in building and we bought the property of course and hmm knowing Dunkirk and knowing by that time the way that people felt they wasn't willing to take major steps but pay twenty three thousand dollars for a house and you're gonna tear it down yeah yeah that's what we did but the house was torn down then the next thing I know a major step a lot of things in between of course but Earl was holding a string holding one end of the, the tape measure when we were squaring up to build this building <coughs> trying to square off of a building that other contractors had built it wouldn't work every way I would measure it wouldn't work July the 4th we was hot and tired but Earl was still with me and I said forget the other building we'll square this one up and we'll build it and fit it into that one so that's exactly what we did and I can show you step by step from the pulling that goes down right there how that we measured that and when we squared it up ready for uh, Foster and company from Cowan to come and set beams for us and I sat right back here with one of the Foster boys in the crane when he was putting these first pullings up sat there with him and you know became friends with that guy if I see him today he would still give me a hug because he's something different than what they had ever worked with when I got it square I was squared the building up to start with I was scared to death of an octagon shaped building what you do with an octagon shaped building you, you measure the square and cut the corners off of it 
So that's exactly what we did on that Perlin in the, in the, the um, footing for it and all. I remember looking at that one, looking at it, when Foster's come over and set the, the framework up, which is that one, that one, that one, all of them, we was only off one eighth of an inch. What does that amount to? So this building is not square, it's octagon shape with the corners cut off of it. And uh, so that's, that's where we were with that. Hot times, yeah, hot times, yeah. All of us, somebody looked at it and said, hmm, we have young people that are fussing over building a building. Here these people are 65 years old, average age, working on a building, not a evil word spoken, just kept on working at it. And uh, I remember when we was pouring the floor for this and we poured sections of it, finished it off. I had a little grandson then. I was supposed to go and see him and Norma was there waiting for me to get there. That little grandson is assistant. What is it, Don? So you see him occasionally on TV if you're, if you're involved in sports. And uh, we was pouring the, had poured the last section of the flooring for this building right there. Again, dead tired. But my wife was saying, you gotta get here tonight. You gotta get here tonight. Remember pushing that trialing machine off over there, loading it on Tim's truck. He had to take it out to Earl's for that day. I said, Tim, you gotta do it. And you gotta take it in tomorrow. I'm going to see my grandson. And so that's the way that all this stuff went, you know. But I finished up, Gail, these things are so real. Gail come along and used a little hand trolley machine to trial the edges of that section right in there. So if you're sitting on it over there, it might fall apart. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, so many things with, with this building. Um, 82 feet from that one to that one. Put a measurement on it, it's there. And uh, how we set those things uh, according to Foster then that was setting up the framework of our building. But we did all of it, the congregation. And I want to say this. I worked with, this was the fifth church I pastored. We did some building in every one of them. But this was the only building that there was never an evil word spoken. Nobody complained to anybody else. We would pour sections of it at a time. Tim and working the midnight shift or whatever. When we got to the place where we would need him, we'd go and wake him up. And he'd come over and help us strike it off and get it going, go back and get a few hours sleep so he could go back to work. But it's just a, a, a great thing, you know, and uh, when you look at it, I didn't think that much about it then, but you're here today sitting in this building from a little old building where, where if we seated a hundred in it, it was packed. And I remember sitting on the platform with Earl. We had over that, well over that, and sitting on the platform a hot Sunday morning, looking out the windows and seeing four couples walk off down the street because there's absolutely no place for them to even stand in the other building. We've got to do something about it. This building, our house sitting here, 
they didn't have a good attitude toward the church, really. And on the other side, the little old lady, she didn't have a good attitude toward the church. We had to win them over before we could do anything. They would not sell to anybody. But they did. They did. I come home from that working witness pro project was on and I said to Tim, you know, that again, have you checked into it? No, but we will. So here we are. The building that really the Lord built. And we were just the instruments saying, help us. That little old lady that wouldn't have anything to do with the church, though, one of the things that I remember well about her, I was bent over doing something on the sign out front. Somebody whapped me across the back part of my Adam, uh, Adam, yeah, back part of my body with a uh, paper that was rolled up. Looked around, it was her. <laughs> By that time, we'd be gained friends, you know. That's better than being enemies with your neighbors at any time. But you know, I, I pastored five different churches, and each one of those churches, I had to make friends with the neighbors, because pastors before I didn't get along with them. My, I'd get along with your neighbors. But you remember what that was like then, little old house sitting back in a wilderness over there? And couldn't hardly see it. But look where you are now. You, sometimes it takes a lot of prayer and waiting on the Lord to work things out. And that's exactly the way it's been with this building from beginning to end. But look where you are. Thank God for it. On this 100th anniversary, hmm, isn't it nice? Isn't it amazing what God can do? We just wait upon Him, keep on praying. And I see people sitting here you thought would never be in the church, but they're here. Thank God for it. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. So where do we go from here? I don't know. But I think there's great things. You know what I visualize? Said this to somebody just a few days ago. Well, that won't happen. I visualize this church owning everything from here to Main Street. <laughs> That's the feeling I get. But you got to remember, I had that feeling more than once. Doesn't look possible, does it? Mm. Just pray and wait and see. Glory be to God for His goodness. Now, what do we do? Where am I supposed to go from here? Tim, what are you supposed to do? What's anyone supposed to do? We just wait and let the Lord have his way. Mm. Well, as the little boy said, Mom, you and I and the Lord knew what we were supposed to do. But now, Mom, just you and Lord know what to do. I don't from here. Well, glory to God for his goodness. Brought my Bible up with me, but I uh, didn't intend to use it when I brought it up with me. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's good to have the word of the Lord with you all the time. I was just carrying it for my support. And so, I don't know where we're supposed to go from here. I do. Tom, what am I supposed to do? I know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Absher. Yeah, you guys can stand and give John a round of applause. That's what you got to be good. Thank you, brother. 
I just can, so I don't want to be near. No, you can just go ahead and go back down if you want. Okay. You go ahead and back down. Do that. Isn't he great? You guys can be seated. You can go have a seat. You need some help, buddy? Okay. And if you didn't think you were going to hear from me today, you're wrong. Because as the pastor of this church, I am honored. Yeah, you guys can be seated. I am honored to be here. What a joy it is to be part of the family of God. Where do we go from here? Reverend Absher asked the question. Where do we go from here? What do we do? Step by step by step, we walk with the Lord. We follow His plan, His direction. Henry Ford once said this. He said that history is bunk. We all know that that isn't true, or, and perhaps institution is more clearly defined by its history than the church. The Christian faith is based on a collection of writings that dates from iniquity. And the Bible is not only a historic book, but a, but a historical book. It tells the history of God dealing with His people. We read the story about what God did for His people thousands of years ago, about the birth of Isaac, the burning bush, parting the Red Sea, and about David and Goliath. We tell the story of the risen Savior just as it was told the first time. 2,000 years back in history. The ancient word ceases our attention to make us people of God. Our faith is further shaped by centurions, centuries in Christian history since the Bible was written. But we are all identified by our history. Matthew introduced Jesus to his readers as Mary and Joseph's boy. If you look in, if you look in Matthew, chapter, Matthew chapter 1, I believe it is, Verses 1 through 17 is the genealogy of Jesus. It's the genealogy of Jesus. And it walks you through step by step how we got to the point to where Jesus was hung on the cross. And they mentioned Jesus. They mentioned Jesus as Mary's boy. Mary's little boy. David, 28 timed great grandson. We owe who we we owe who we are. We owe who we are to our past, right? To our past. Our heritage, our upbringing, our education, our tradition. And the reason I wanted Pastor, Pastor Absher's family to stand up, because I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see from him and Norma down in the ages where they have been and where they are now. That history. If you look at your own genealogy, your own family. There's a history there, isn't there? There's a history. When I think about this church, when I think about this church, and I look at family members, and I look at all of you, and I see the heritage, the history, the genealogy, so to speak, of where you were and where you are today. And as the baton is passed over and over and over again. As the baton is passed over and over again. The question is asked, the question asked is this. Will you take it? Will you take the baton? Will you take the baton? The next hundred years... And I'll tell you who Reverend Absher was talking to. It was me. He popped in to see me the other day. And uh, what him and I talked about was some of the history that we talked about and, and maybe even some of our future. Because he talked about this back, the, 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 the doors and the squareness of the building and all that stuff like that. And how, how hard it would be to build off of that building over there and, and all that. I was listening to him and all that. And I said, I, I wouldn't build off of that anyways. 
I've told you this many times, and I'll tell you again. And I'm not saying it may even happen in my lifetime. But I see a facility out in this backyard, a gymnasium, where we have children and children and children and children and children ministering, ministering, ministering. That's just my vision. And we'll build off of that because it's square, John told me. You have to worry about that door back there. It's square back there, so. Matthew also knew that his past isn't enough. His past isn't enough. So many times we think about our past, don't we? Man, you know, if we could just go back to whatever. If we could just go back to that date and time of our lives, wouldn't that be awesome and amazing? Wasn't, God, wasn't, wasn't it good then? Here's the thing, you can never go back. And here's another thing, you can never even stay in the present. We only have the future to look forward to, right? We only have the future to look forward to, what God is going to do next. What God is going to do next. Pastor Kellerman was here last night. And he shared a message that if you were here or you're watching online, you should have drove a nail right to your feet explaining to us, but if, but if, what's next, what now? What God, God wants to do. Our history is enough. He wanted to correct the vision of those people who were always looking to the past for meaning. The real point of all those generations of Israelites, he claimed, was that they were leading us to something that we, that we were to follow. We can learn a lot from our past. The most important function is that for the past, for what the past does, Reverend Absher, is it leads us to the future. The past leads us to the future. What's next? And Jesus made that plain. He told his disciples to remember what he had done. They also turned their attention to the future tasks of his ministry, preparing them for. Go and be my witnesses, he said. Go and be my witnesses. Go and work in the vineyards. Go make disciples. Jesus never let his disciples dwell on what they had already been done. Their purpose was not to be found where they had been, but where they were going. Our faith is born and nurtured as in a historical experience. What God has done for us in the past always leads us to what He wants to do through us in the future. He doesn't want us to, he doesn't want to leave us in the past. He doesn't want us to leave us. We, we, we dressed up in the, in the 20s on Friday, 70s on last night, but God doesn't want us to be there. He's looking to 2022, 2023. What's next? Our past should lead us to our future. What's next? And the question is this, where are we going? The question, where are we going? As the Reverend Absher said, has still a greater significance because as Christians, we know that our history has, been, has, has an eternal direction. An ultimate goal. In the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ, the world has been set towards its final moment. Which will be both finished and begun anew. We, along with Abraham and Sarah, Boaz and Ruth, Joseph and Mary, and hundreds of generations of sons and daughters of God, are part of the history that flows into God's own eternity. One of the most important theological books of the last 25 years is The Theology of Hope. From the first to last, written by Molten Man and Christian is Hope. Forward-looking and forward-moving, the promise that the future is ultimately in God's hands is the glow that suffices everything here in the dawn as expected new day. It is our faith in the end of times that directs our journey through time. And here's the thing. The church, the church, and you guys, I'm going to make this clear, Reverend After you built a beautiful building here. I love this building. I walk in every, every I, I, I get the privilege of being here every morning. And I walk into this place. And I walk into this structure. This strong, mighty building that you all built. But this isn't the church. 
This isn't the church. You're the church. You are the church. And as much as we would like to say, well, I was in church Sunday morning. No, you were the church on Sunday morning. You were the church on Sunday morning. You just came here and joined us in this wonderful facility, right, that you all built. But you are the church. In the next hundred years, I promise you that I probably will not be here in the next hundred years since our celebration. If I am, Lord help us. Amen. If I'm here, Judy, you have to be here too. But God is so faithful. He's so true and He's so just. He's on time and He's present. And our future is so bright that I need to wear sunglasses. Because what's coming up next like Reverend Aftra said, I don't know. We pray and we wait. We pray and we wait. Lord, what's next? What do you have for us? What's the next generation going to do? What do you want me to do? Pastor Tim mentioned something about how the way he prays now. He doesn't pray, Lord, what do you want me to do? He says he prays this way. Lord, what are you doing that you want me to get involved in? Lord, what are you doing that you want me to jump into? Maybe that's the way, as a church, we should be praying. Lord, what are you doing that you want me to get invested in? We are his first fruit. The first drawing of God's presence in the world, in our world today. Its purpose is both to remember God's faithfulness, kindness, and mercy, and providence through our history up to now, and to move us in our world towards the goal God has given us. And I think about my friends. I think about my friends Bill Hamilton. The history of Bill Hamilton and Nancy Hamilton. I think about them. I think about Earl and Ruth. And oh, oh, Bob and Bob Farling. Bob Farling. All these men and women who have gone before us, who are no longer here, who were literally pillars of this church holding it up. And I'm sure there's many more that I haven't mentioned. Miss Hazel. Oh, Sister Davenport. Brother Bob. I never met Bob Davenport, but I was told that it was probably good that I didn't. Because it would probably not be good that him and I were together very often. I think about all these beautiful people who have gone before. And now it's up to us for the future. The next hundred years belong to us. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with it? Right? I'm going to ask Sister Judy to come back up. I think we got another hymn to do and we got another worship song we're going to play. Just your song? Okay. We got one more song to do, I guess. Sorry, Judy. <laughs> I wanted to hear you play again. <laughs> we got the worship team coming up. And let's remember how great our God is. Great are you, Lord. And do me a favor. Let's sing this like we mean it. Let's sing this from the bottom of our shoes. Not from our hearts, but from our shoes. Stand with me, would you? Let's cry out to God this morning. And Margaret, when we're done, I want you to come up and pray. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark.
Father, this morning. You are worthy of our praise. Thank you. Praise your name. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Amen. Yeah. 